second. This is fucking weird. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. It is the Hudson Valley Squares. We are watching Sea of Tranquility right now. And um, it's kind of weird because this time Pete isn't hosting. I am hosting. And I'll briefly explain um, why in a second. But uh, we're doing an episode all about bands uh, tonight that we think jumped the shark uh, for whatever reason, whether it was an album release, a lineup change, a tour, um, whatever it may be uh, that made you kind of fall off the bandwagon of liking that band. And uh, maybe you jumped back on, maybe you didn't, um, but that is what we were discussing tonight. And um, really quick, the reason why I kind of took the reins, thank you, Pete, for allowing me to, um, just, I, I couldn't, was really having a hard time trying to pick uh, any kind of band and I just ex was explaining to the guys before we hopped on here and I, I think it has to do with the fact that all of my favorite bands um, released their best records or the most um, well-known parts of their career the good and the bad uh, before I was you know born to see it and um, I think that I just kind of I haven't really had the opportunity to you know like Kiss, for example, when Kiss went disco, you know, I, I they were already back and re reunited and broken up by the time I found out about Kiss. And so mm -hmm. uh, I just don't listen to that stuff if I don't like it. So I kind of just had a hard time coming up with anything that was really of any substance. So I decided to sit back and take the hosting seat tonight. But everybody else we were talking about before has quite a few picks. So um, this time around, Pete's going to go first. He never goes first. Um, then we're going to do Chris Allo, Craig, Chris uh, Cans, and then Steve Keeler. We're going to go that order. So uh, Pete. Sounds good. Share. All right. So I'm going to, um, my first pick is uh, a band that I think I've talked a lot about over the years on this channel about how I really don't like them at all. But the funny thing is I used to. That band is Motley Crue. I was completely on board with the Motley Crue train for Too Fast for Love and Shout at the Devil. I mm -hmm. dig those albums a lot when they came out, listened to them all the time, saw them out on tour numerous times during those couple of years and was totally like, these guys are cool. They rock live, the, the albums kick ass, and it was something a little new and different at the time, right? Uh, but then they put out that album, Theater of Pain. And I remember thinking, I really don't like Home Sweet Home. I really don't like Smoking in the Boys Room. I noticed like a lot of those songs on that album for me just don't do much for me. But I was I was going to give them a pass. I'm like, because I'm, I'm usually good that way. It's like, you know, everybody can put out a bad album. But then that Girls, Girls, Girls album came out. And I'm like, no, that's it. I am officially off the train. I just was not into this whole new glammy thing that they were doing. And it was obvious to me that they were looking to just sell, you know, millions and millions of records. And they, they just, the, the image kind of changed. And honestly, I haven't liked any of their stuff since then, the John Karabi album, notwithstanding. So, so for everybody who thinks that I hated Motley Crue from the beginning, I did not, I probably, and I haven't done it in a, long time i probably could listen to too fast for love or shadow the devil today and probably think ah that's still not too bad i choose not to uh but if i was forced to do so i probably wouldn't mind them that much but anything after that with the exception of was the self-titled album with with karabi uh don't like any of it uh i just they they took a turn for a direction that i really did not like at all and i think the crew that i liked early on they kind of it's almost like they decided to become a diff totally different band so that's my first choice motley crew yeah that's a i i've heard you talk about that before and um i mean i i really like motley crew and i was saying before um we got on they kind of did the same thing to me when but for a different reason they were the one one band that i could come up with an example of of i kind of stopped liking them i really love motley crew but i am really not a huge fan of the fact that they did the first fel farewell tour and made such a big deal and signed the whole contract and like you know, we're never going to tour again and holding funerals and shit. And then, you know, three years later, uh, when the money is dwindling, they're like, hey, we totally don't hate each other. And like, we're on like separate tour buses like we were talking about. Vince can't sing, but we're going to go do it anyway. Hey, why not? Right? You, know, you know why they're doing it? Because the fans, the yeah. fans wanted it. Fans have spoken. Demanded it. Demanded, I talked demanded about it. Before. Like, they, they brought up the that my generation, like because of the dirt, like became such huge fans. 
I live, I'm living with people my age and like they, nobody, I don't know a single other person still my age who's like, yes, Motley Crue. I'm the only one of my friend group, you know? So it's like, I, I don't buy that, but I mean, I don't know. You, I, I think it's a valid point though, Pete, that you have, even though- I mean, I you know, there's a lot of, I, I, I think I'm kind of in the minority, I think, because I, I still know so many people who are my age who really still love the band and that's great. Um, I don't, and I don't have to, and I, I choose not to, so. Okay. Um, all right, I guess we're on to uh, Chris Allo. Okay, cool. Um, thanks, Sydney. Yeah, my pick uh, as a band that I, I loved, like I think the first five or six records, uh, and then they started to take a downturn, and then for me, it just it just nosedived a few years later. Uh, they were a band that were um, fairly well-known in the scene, especially in New York. Man, these guys were big in New York. Uh, and I got connections to the to Black Sabbath. Uh, I'm talking about New York's Man of War. Uh, man, I love the first you know five records. Uh, Kings of Metal, I think, is one of the greatest records ever. Seen them a bunch in the '80s, uh, but after Kings of Metal, they were starting to go on a downward slope. I think it was only one record in the '90s they did. I remember me and Steve Keeler saw them in this little tiny club in New Jersey because they. Mothers. they mothers and it was yeah. it was the craziest thing ever like i remember like you couldn't get tickets and when i talked to the club they were like well just go to the club the day of the show which i remember was a sunday and they were like there'll be some guy selling tickets in the parking lot they were like you could buy tickets from him and i was like i remember talking to steve I'm like is this is is this for real steve's like i don't yeah. know so I, I went with my girlfriend at the time we waited for like hours in this fucking parking lot and then some some little dude came out we bought tickets from him and then we had to sit in our car and wait for hours for the fucking show to start it was so terrible but the show Man. was great they were great um but things things took a turn in 2002. uh the first i seen them twice in 2002 though first gig was great they headlined the march metal meltdown in asbury park yeah. new jersey and made us wait forever there. then too and craig was there like arch enemy and cannibal corpse and a shit ton of bands played and i was filming um the festival for uh the promoter jack koshik uh, and I, i'll never forget joey DeMeo's or DeMaio's brother came out and he was like hey you can't film them but he was super cool and he let me sit in the photo pit like in you know with literally where the barricade is so i was you know four feet to the stage it was me and joey's brother and i saw them from four feet away which of the 2000 shows i seen i only got the chance to do that once and that was awesome uh, and that was great. But then they went on the road with Immortal, and I wanted to see Immortal. So I saw them. It was May 22nd, 2002, at the Vanderbilt in Plainview, New York, which is this club in Long Island. And they didn't have a, a really good attendance there. And I think more than half the audience was there for Immortal. And after Immortal played, like the place like emptied out. Wow. What, what, what really made me look at Man of War in a different light was during the set for some reason joey DeMaio started picking on this guy in the front row and he was like in the in the very front against the barricade and he had his girlfriend there and she was a normal looking attractive girl but you know and he was like hey make sure we give these guys uh backstage passes because i want this guy to watch me while i fuck his girlfriend after the show tonight and it was like, the audience was like, what? <laughs> and it was oh like, and, but he just kept going on and on. He's like, yeah, wow. you buddy. Yeah, you're going to watch while I fuck your girlfriend after after the show. And I'm like, it, I wanted to hide. I'm like, dude, there's nobody here. There's like, a, this fucking guy stayed. Everybody else left and he's in the front row and you're picking on him? Like, what kind of dick bag are you? Uh, it's not like he was... Now, I don't know if something went on, but I I saw the guy. He wasn't like giving Jeremiah the thing or nothing. So I don't know what went on, but it was the weirdest, most cringeworthy thing I've ever seen at a show. And I was like, wow, dude, you're kind of a dick. Like, this is weird. I talked to Abbott later. He was like, yeah, the Man of War guys were, were not cool. That was not a good tour for us. Uh, then they just started putting out EPs and they did some DVDs that I bought from Steve and it was just them like dicking around. Like they weren't even playing full concerts. So 
like the whole amount of 2002 I was like, ah, fuck you guys, I'm out, I'm off this train. I still love all the old stuff, but uh, man, I jumped off 20 years ago and I don't miss them because they're another band. They've pulled tons of weird shit. They re-recorded their old records. They did a farewell tour, charged a ton of money. And yeah. they said, oh no, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna retire because the fans demanded that we keep going. So yeah, I'm, I'm done with Van of War, but I, I do still love the old stuff. Wow. And that... The Man of War stories is crazy ones. I mean, they held fests like three years ago, yeah. where they were. They held like, up the people, I mean, they're. I mean, Man of War has a huge following in Europe still. Yeah, massive. Like they're as big as any of the other bands over there. They can headline a hell fest, and their reason for canceling was because they couldn't practice at a cer certain volume, and yeah. and that and Sabaton had to step in and play their set after they played the night before Sabaton took the place of Man of War that night. So. Yeah, but, they're, uh, they're a weird fucking band. They, they have giant egos, Man of War. Oh, massive. 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 Listen, all, these, all these guys do, but you know, some of them, I guess, can keep it in check. But mm. oof, those, guys, those guys are Man of War. They, they need a, a, a reality check for sure. Well, oh, I've never understood like that whole, that whole thing of, you know, at this point, you're 30 years or at that point you weren't 30 years but you were like 15 years out from like the the prime of your career and like you're still I mean you're still going so like congratulations like that's awesome that's kick ass but like don't be a dick about it that's just right. wild yeah. I mean that, like you said the, the place emptied out so the few fans that are there you're you're gonna pick on this guy right. around that same time like they couldn't draw at clubs in in the states but there was they, people would riot and European, like I think it was in Greece, they had a riot when the when the album came out. People were like breaking stuff to get it. You remember that Chris? around yeah. that time? I mean, it's it is. They are huge over there, but yeah, yeah. over here they couldn't get arrested. And I, I, I know, and they would come. They play like a one off show, like in the New York area, and they would yeah. charge like a hundred bucks a ticket to go to like BB King's. Oh yeah, so small to see them. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I remember it. everybody was outraged when when whenever they came. I, on the and I think Pete, that was the last time they came was because uh, I looked it up. Uh, 2014 was their last time in the states and yeah they were charging an outrageous amount of money i think i think scow went to one of those i remember wow. scow and pete morano used to went to one of those i'm like now nah, wait i don't need to go see him again i've seen yeah. him a million times but yeah. i love him i'm not quite as harsh as chris with us on them but <laughs> i mean that's that that story was kind of screwed up so i could understand <laughs> yeah, true, a true story swear and listen, not like I'm I'm slut shaming. It's not like the girl was dressed like a hooker or anything. I mean, she was just a normal girl yeah. in the front row, standing next to a normal guy. And Joey DeMaio just for whatever reason wanted to pick on him. Hey, Chris, this is kind of pro wrestling like that. Is it's kind of like if MJF was on stage? Yes, that's true. I mean, I it's a typical wrestling thing. Like, yo, wait later on, I'll be with your yes. girl on the back. That would, yeah, he was he was turning heel on him. That's for sure. Uh. All right, uh, next up, Craig, what you got? Uh, first, I uh, wanted to say hi to everybody. It's the first time on a, Mon on a Monday show. And, uh, first and, time. Uh, and Craig, are you bourboning? I saw you uh, sipping yeah. a little amber colored yeah. liquor. Right, so. Yeah, I got, uh, I think it's Yellowstone uh, is what I'm, what I'm uh, oh. got, got tonight. Oh, and Steve, I wanted to say one of my favorite episodes of Rock Fantasy was the was the uh, the episode where you guys had Ross the Boss on and you were oh, all yeah. around saying the, uh, your favorite uh, Man of War songs. And uh, Ryan, I remember saying, telling him, it's like, that song makes me want to run right through a brick wall, you know, and he and Ross was yeah. just loving it and everything. It was, it was a really fun show. So thank you. Time, that was a great one. Uh, sorry for, I didn't realize it was your first, um, your first time yes, on the channel. So first, no, I'm no, not no, sure. first time on a Monday. Oh, first time on the Monday. Okay, cool. Well, first time in prime time <laughs> on, the big, on the big slot, <laughs> you know. But, Don't let it go uh, to your head now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh all right my my first one in in 1983 i was 11 years old and i remember getting a, a cassette by this band and a uh, as a result of seeing the three videos that they that they had on uh tv at the, at the time and i distinctly remember my brother who's three years older than me saying to my mom you're gonna let him get that this is too heavy for him and my mom was like, you know, you know, I, I don't even know what this is, but whatever. Those three videos happened to be photograph, 
Rock of a uh, yeah, Rock of Ages and F -f 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 which was probably my favorite out of those three. Now, as we all know, what December 31st, 1984, uh, Rick Allen has his arm torn off, and they don't have uh, they don't come out with another album for uh, four years, I believe. In '87, it came out, so now I'm 15 years old, and I see the and even in, and in between then. I really, I still like the Pyromania album a lot. And my radio, my local radio station used to also play uh, Bringing On the Heartbreak, uh, even, you know, it's, so it's like, oh, there's another song that I like. I had a, I had said this in the Monsters Den last week, we had a uh, satellite dish uh, at growing up. So I had access to Much Music, which was the Canadian MTV. They used to show a lot of different videos that uh, MTV didn't show, including the videos for uh, Let It Go, Saturday Night High and Dry, and Me and My Wine, which, you know, so I really liked High and Dry. And I didn't discover on through the night until until a few years later. But I distinctly remember the world premiere video for Women, the first song from Hysteria to come out. And it was, it was okay, but it didn't exactly make me want to go run out and buy the album. But each subsequent single that they released, and I had to double check on this, there were seven goddamn singles from that album. <laughs> I hated every single one of them. I mean, Animal, Hysteria, uh, Love Bites. Uh, the, I, and I despise Pour Some Sugar on Me. I remember hearing that when I, you know, in eight, you know, 88 or so, and, you know, hearing that at high school dances. I mean, imagine a, a whole room full of 15 to 16 year old white kids trying to dance to Pour Some Sugar on Me. It's, it's impossible. That The beat is just awful. I just hated that song. And Armageddon it and rock it. Or it's like sticking a number two pencil in my ear. I, I immediately was off the bandwagon on Def Leppard. And then what took another five years for them to release a follow-up. And that sounded exactly like the album from five years prior. I mean, Let's Get Rocked is like a completely brain dead song that I never ever want to hear again. And and, and what was the next one? Uh, Make love like a man. I, I don't. I don't even know what that means. So I. I. I it's just. It's horrible. So, Def Leppard is my was the very first band that I thought of when uh, when Chris said about Jump the Shark, where I was off that bandwagon in 1987 when they released their fourth album, Hysteria. But I still enjoy the first three. Yeah, wow. they jumped. They jumped the shark for me on that album too. So yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I feel like I'm the only one that actually really loves hysteria. <laughs> you know, it's not, not, it's not, it's not, a, it's, yeah, I mean, it's a strong album for them, but not if I mean, you're more into the heavier edge of things, you're not going to like it as much. Yeah. I mean, it yeah, just it sounded so fake too. Just it's it, the, the way the drums sound and those, those yeah. gang vocals, it, it, you know, background vocals and that it just, it was so, it was just so synthetic sounding. Mm. It was it, really it, overproduced. Like I, I read stories of like, they would, um, like you know mutt would have you know phil or steve you know like literally play each note of the chord so that it would sound like sound perfect right. it, like shit like that which is like just crazy which it definitely i mean probably that's why it took like four however many four years, years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, ever, if ever i'm in the car with my wife and the and then that and that song comes on the radio i mean i, I just I, I have to turn it i hate it so yeah, i just despise it so much pour some sugar on me i mean or armageddon it it's like what what the fuck is that just say i'm get i'm getting it or something it's like Come on, Steve. Come i on. i just hate it <laughs> uh, it's funny um all right uh chris cans you're up hey uh i had def leopard as one of mine too uh i really i jumped off with pyromania though i just okay. even earlier nice. i went to the store and waited for that album that came out bought it on the day it came out and it wasn't for me i still i like it now and i love the first two but by the time hysteria came around i was just like more of this you know these guys forget it but that's i'll skip those guys and go to one of my other ones um this is a band that has been around forever several different lineups several different iterations 
um, Jefferson Airplane, then they became Jefferson Starship. And I just got some weird thing on my screen, sorry. You know, Jefferson Starship, they started out kind of funky and weird and, you know, they were doing some kind of crazy shit. And then they had two albums where they really started to rock. And I'm, I'm talking about like Freedom at Point Zero and yeah. the one that followed uh, Modern Times. I love those albums. And that's kind of where I really, I mean, I had heard of them and, you know, everybody knew, you know, Grace Slick and everything. And they're like, well, Grace is back in the band on that Modern Times record. And, you know, I was like, these guys, you know, they've really changed themselves. They're ready to go for the 80s. Mickey Thomas is great. You know, this is for that time, pretty rock and music. And then they uh, sort of just, I don't know what they did, but they, they came out with this album called Nuclear Furniture, which was just filled with synthesizer, synthesizer laden garbage and just set the stage for the whole Starship. We built this city thing a few years later. But, you know, Nuclear Furniture for me was just like, what happened? You know, you had turned yourselves into a really good hard rock band. Then you decided to just take a huge dump on all your accomplishments and, and piss me off. So Jefferson, the last, you know, iteration of Jefferson Starship sort of ended it for me. And really anything after that, I have paid absolutely zero attention to. Winds of Change but, is a really good album. I think that's the last really good one, I think. That was later though, right? Wasn't that in the... Or was that right like before? New, I don't remember. But that's yeah. a good one. That's a good one. But yeah, the other it's I'll have yeah. to check back, you know. But I mean, I still love Freedom of Point Zero in modern times. Oh yeah, those are those are killer. Yeah, really good. So you almost can't tell what the um like that it's the same band. Like, you know, we built the city, or like you listen to We Built the City and then you listen to Jane and you're like, How I don't yeah. know. <laughs> or nothing's gonna stop us now. <laughs> it's absolutely really bad. <laughs> Decided not to rock anymore. They're like, this is too hard. Let's just I think, I, think, I think I saw Freedom at Point Zero tour at SPAC with 38 Special for some reason once. Really? Okay. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I liked them because I liked them from the 60s and I was trying to hold on to what they had. Like that album wasn't bad, but uh, yeah. So Chris, Winds even... of Change was 82, Nuclear Furniture was 84. Okay. For me, Winds of Change is a really good album. That's that's their last really good album, in my opinion. Yeah, I didn't spend much time with that one. Yeah, Nuclear that's a good, that's a good me either. <laughs> right. Although I will say, I mean, Nuclear Furniture has at least laying it on the line, which I think is a pretty good song, but the rest of it's kind of like, eh. But no no way outs on that too, right? Uh, yeah, that was a huge it is. hit for them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. I think that really started making me think about Starship when I listened to that the last time. I'm like, Look what they're doing. <laughs> I can see where this is all headed, and it's oh, bad. Yeah. yeah, that's right. They're going for the big time. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, Steve, what you got? First, uh, I will start off with one that no one's picked, and I thought someone would have ready. But uh, it's a band that I got to see on their first tour in '83, I believe it was. I saw them in Middletown. I saw them at Port Jervis. It was a band. Metallica, probably the biggest thrash metal band in the world, and still are. But somewhere along the road, they decided to part ways with my tastes. And I'll give it up to the Black Album. I'm going to go deep for still. thought that was a decent record. It wasn't what, you know, it wasn't Kill Em All. It wasn't their early, dirty thrash and heavy stuff. But uh, then, like, they were kind of my, my heroes back then. And they were Metallica. They were these guys that were just coming out and playing this great music. And I got to meet Cliff Burton once, and I, they were my guys. And then all of a sudden, they show up on a MTV award. I think it was an MTV award. It was something. And I remember being at a party, and we're like so happy Metallica was going to be on this thing. And they show up wearing fur coats, and they cut their hair, and they wanted to change their whole image. And you know what? They changed from me being a fan, and I've never really gone back. I know that, you know, a lot of people love the newer stuff they've done. I have had no, no cares, but I listen to it. I think it's decent, but I think it, it sound, always sounds forced to me. So I'm going to get Metallica haters tonight. People are going to hate me because I don't like them, uh, at least nowadays. And I mean, I love them back in the day. So 
I guess I don't have to explain much more, but uh, I don't know. They lost me. It was definitely polarizing point in their career. It's funny it's how, like when I when I was young, I, I mean, probably as a result of not knowing any better, but I mean, but I used to, Lars Ulrich is such a great drummer, you know, and everything. And it's funny how now he's probably easily seen as the weakest uh, link of the four. And uh, a, their last two albums have a lot of that. It's almost like a military snare type sound on them where it's simplistic, but I, I don't know. It's like he's, it's like he's, it's, it's like he forgot, he, he doesn't practice anymore and kind of like just lost the skill. I, I, I don't know. It's just, it, it just, it, like, like Steve said, it sounds like it's a little forced. And then they were doing like those Orion Fests, the first one they did in Atlantic City. And you figure, well, they got the power to make this coolest like metal and have all these metal bands. And they didn't really want to have any metal bands with them. And then I don't know how true all this is, but they, I believe that they, they added metal later on. They said, "Well, who who should we get to play metal?" Because they wanted that. They wanted their fans to listen to the music that they like listening to. And I'm, I don't know. It was just seemed very strange to me in general. Yeah, I remember seeing the listing for that concert. Um, I think it was two nights they were doing. And like yeah. one of the nights, the gimmick was they were going to do like all of Ride the Lightning, and I'm like, "That's kind of cool." Yeah. And, like, and I remember sure. looking like, "All right, who else is playing this festival?" And the old, and I think the two bands that I remember it was like the Red Hot Chili Peppers and whoever the Arctic Monkeys are. Oh yeah, that's like, a lot of like, wow. Like so, you couldn't get like Budgie and Diamond Head, but you got the Arctic Monkeys. Who, yeah, whoever they had the fuck a lot that of, is, I, I don't know. They're available. <laughs> they had a lot of well, it was stuff that they said. They had a press conference and they said they if you put their shuffle on spin this is what they wanted to they, they share the music they listened to with their fans and it wasn't they were far from metal because they they interviewed them and he said oh well we're going to be the only metal band but then that changed because i don't think they were selling enough tickets but they had a couple of those fests and i don't think they made any money on any of them no, they people all didn't lost come money. Out. but i have great friends and i no disrespect to metallica because i have good friends that still love everything they do right now sure can't forget about yeah, that's that. That's funny you mentioned that, Chris. Sorry, Sid. No, um, Arctic Monkeys have probably sold a million t shirts that say, Who the fuck are the Arctic Monkeys? On? <laughs> Seriously? That's Seriously. funny. Probably. Uh, I had no idea. I've heard the name. I, I couldn't tell you a song they sing. I've heard the name. But, uh, no. I sell, I mean, I, <laughs> I sell, I sell their vinyl in my shop. I, I, I'm not a fan, but yeah, they're one of the newer bands. But that's something that Lars or whomever in the band, though. Oh, our fans are going to like them because we like them. Yeah. Right. But, you know, that <laughs> goes along with the point, like, you know, along that same time, Steve, in, you know, in the, the 90s and the early 2000s, Metallica was the band who, you know, they weren't taking out Arch Enemy or no. Behemoth. Who were they taking out? They were going out on the road with Limp Biscuit and Corn and mm -hmm. bands like that. Well, they had changed their style a little bit. And I mean, they, I mean, that it was solid radio rock, what they were putting out. I mean, give me fuel, give me fire and all these things, you know, it were used on NASCAR and, you know, all this stuff, but it was just not for me anymore. Yeah. yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So that's my number one. Cool. Cool. I guess we are, uh, we're back to you, Pete. All right. So, so this uh, artist I actually still like him uh, and respect him a lot because he's been such a big part of my life as, you know, an amazing guitar player. And I still like to listen to a lot of his albums, but I, I kind of jump for me, he kind of jumped the shark, like maybe about four albums ago. Uh, it's Ingve Malmsteen. So he did a couple albums with Tim Ripper Owens, uh, you know, Relentless was the last one. And I thought that was a good pairing because, you know, Ripper, I, I for me, Ingve has got to have a strong vocalist who he shares the stage with, who sings all the songs, maybe helps write some of the stuff, because I, to me, Ingve can't be a one man show. I just, he's an amazing guitar player, but he needs to have other musicians in the band and a strong singer for his stuff to really work. So after Ripper left, for whatever the reason, I mean, can you imagine those two egos trying to work together? Uh, Ingve decides, you know what, screw it. I've worked with a million singers in my career. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm going to sing on every album going forward. And you know what? I'm going to play all the instruments too. 
And basically that's what we've got. So we've got Spellbound, World on Fire, Blue Lightning, Parabellum. You know, they're not terrible albums, I don't think, uh, but I've heard all of them. I don't feel the need to own them. His voice isn't terrible, but it isn't great. And to me, it's just like every album now sounds like a retread of everything he's done because it's just him. There's nobody kind of helping him make this stuff really engaging to the listener and and worthwhile to get. I don't know. I just I think this guy needs like a reality check. He's such a fantastic guitar player. He's one of the legends, but he seems to think now, like, I don't need anybody else. It's just the Yngwie Malmsteen show. And maybe in a way, weird way, it kind of always has been that way. But I just find these albums, there's just no variety on them at all. And his voice, while not terrible, isn't really that good. And he sounds the same on every single album. He's writing all the songs, playing every line of every song. It's just just doesn't work for me anymore and i just basically said until ingve decides that he's going to do something a little bit different and try and form a band again with a strong lead singer i mean he's worked with joel and turner and gore and yeah. edmund and uh Bonnet. it's got solo and all these guys man great singers and 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 they all contributed really well to the albums they worked on with him but he for whatever mm -hmm. reason that's not good enough for him he wants to be the only guy and while he's still in that mindset i'm off the train so that is my next pick. I've uh, I've heard other people echo that, Pete. In fact, I just saw a post on social media where someone was saying the same exact thing you were. He's actually coming around. Anybody that's in the Hudson Valley, he's, yeah, playing, he's been playing Sugarloaf. But I'm kind playing of down at Sugarloaf uh, for OME, uh, which is a new concert promoter in the area, and uh, that's happening, I think, in May. Yeah, I, I just I've seen him a, a bunch of times, and that's the other thing. Like aside from even just the albums. Ingve is obviously incredibly talented. We, you know, we understand. But a lot of the songs that I love are songs that, that you know, have a vocalist on them. Mm -hmm. You know, I love Odyssey. I love Trilogy. I, I love, you know, Queen in Love and, and, you know, Heaven and Night and the songs that have vocals on them. And then you go and see him. And I think the first time I saw him, he played like a very short snippet of Heaven Tonight. He played like the first verse and I think his bass player sang it and it was like done. And then the second time I saw him, they I don't even think he did anything really with vocals. Oh, wow. And it's just like, you know, eventually, and then he plays for like two and a half hours and it's like, eventually you get to the end of the show and you're like, you know, I'm an Ingve fan, but I could probably go like five years without seeing him again because it's just, you know, that was enough for like, that was enough for me for a while. Because you're not playing any of the songs, you're just playing arpeggio number seven, like 12 times for you know two and a half hours and it's like okay dude i want to hear i want to hear you know no, you don't right? remember i'll never forget come on didn't he play a show in poughkeepsie a couple of years ago where it was he just yeah. it was him and backing tracks yeah i was gonna yeah. say that this that was my number two pete that i was gonna pick was ingve <laughs> yeah. um and i've seen him a ton of times real quick but I, mm -hmm. when i saw him in 2014 was the first time that he had uh, a keyboard player and the keyboard player did some vocals and ingve did some vocals and i thought that was shit but then it was my birthday in 2017. Uh, so I was born yeah. May 13th. I saw him at the chance. We went with a bunch of friends. We got tanked yeah. before. And that that show in particular for me was Ingve Jumping the Shark because they took the keyboard player, which did some vocals, and pushed him off stage. Oh. So on stage, it was just Ingve and the drummer. And in the back left, they had the bass player, but he wasn't allowed to move. And that show problems. was so terrible. I'm like, I'm fucking done. You suck. I'm Did out. He had a bunch of sound problems that night too. Like, I think like something was wrong yes. with his ears, and he got like upset. Um, well, I had some sound problems myself. It might have been the, the twelve beers I drank. Uh, yeah, Ingve definitely. I do remember him having some yeah. some issues with yeah. uh, with sound. But yeah, terrible, terrible. Yeah. I have to. I have to admit, I have not seen him since the '80s. I saw him at the Capitol Theater. I for like one of one of his first albums and I saw him opening up for some big band at Glens Falls it might have been ACDC or something years ago I don't remember now but every time I saw him he had like Scott Soto or like Joe and Turner someone, or someone, someone singing really so. notable, yeah I mean yeah. listen to me he's got Richie Blackmore disease from the 70s he's got a great great vocalist but he puts him on the fucking side but now he's you know Richie Richie grew out of that Ingve only got worse he's like ah Fuck it, I don't need a singer. Just put that jerk yeah. off in the corner. <laughs> oh, man. 
All right, cool. I guess uh, we're gonna head over to uh, Greg. What's your number two? Greg. <laughs> and, Greg, uh, sorry. Gotta <laughs> fuck it up. Um, my uh, my next choice is a uh, is a is a legend uh, in in the field, and uh, I got off at uh, in the beginning of the '90s, and that uh, this was the last. This is the last album. That's Ozzy Osbourne that I had mm -hmm. that I had uh, really enjoyed by him, and. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, even at the time, his uh, his tour was called No More Tours. He plays with Black Sabbath uh, uh, at uh, out in California, and that we all know about with uh, uh, with the, the uh, with the guys. And uh, but then, and he said, he, yeah, "That's it. I'm done." Four years later, he puts out an album called Osmosis, which I went out and bought as a new release, and just found it really boring. Uh, except for maybe two songs that uh, that I can recall, Perry Mason was okay, and uh, there was another one I think called Thunder Underground that was all right, but uh, just just didn't didn't capture me uh, capture you know any of the the magic from the the previous albums. Uh, ironically, that was the only tour that I saw him live on. Uh, he played with uh, Sepultura and Danzig. Uh, and I saw him uh, for, for that tour in Philadelphia. But uh, he's had maybe, I, I've never bought any of his other uh, solo discs since, since uh, No More Tears. But I mean, there's maybe a couple songs that I've heard here and there that are, that are okay, but not enough for me to go out and buy the album. I mean, I did buy the Black Sabbath 13, uh, when, which, I, which I do like, and... Uh, but just his solo material just just hasn't done anything for me. So uh, I have a hard stop at, at No More Tears for Ozzy. I would agree with you 100%. That's yeah. a great pick. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. That's a good pick, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Craig, don't bother with any of those other solo albums. They're all boring as shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely not. That is great. And uh, and fun, fun fact for uh, uh, No More Tears, in 1992, uh, I got myself into really good shape and I did two bodybuilding contests and uh, I used No More Tears as my, uh, so, as my uh, background uh, so, uh, music while I was doing my routine. And subsequently I was able to win this uh, nice. as, a nice. of, as a result of my, uh, my hard work. So, uh, so I always I always have a soft spot for that song and everything because I uh, worked really hard and got to, uh, and got to do that there and uh, stand stand around in front of a bunch of people with little little skimpy shorts on. So, <laughs> and, That's uh, how it works. <laughs> yeah. So I remember somebody asking me, it's like, wow, you, people are looking at you, you know, like you're a piece of meat, you know. And I said, yeah, I kind of liked it. So <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was good for a few minutes because it, it'll never happen again. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, still have a soft spot for uh, for no more tears. Yeah, um, Chris, I think I skipped you by mistake. Um, I didn't. I got the order screwed up. So, Chris, okay. uh, you you can go now. Sorry, I don't know how you do this, Pete, with like twelve people. I'm over here like trying to remember the order in my head. Oh, so, yeah. it's not easy. It's not easy. <laughs> well, I'll make it quick. Uh, this is a newer band uh, that I jumped on, and then I I lasted a couple years, I guess, and then jumped off. I know I know Sydney's a fan. Long story short, uh, I flew to Iron, uh, flew to Texas to interview Iron Maiden, and I hung out with um, Gutz, who was the editor of Rock Hard magazine, which is like the like the, one of the biggest metal magazines in the world, Germany. And after we heard that new my Iron Maiden record, which was called, it's the one I hate. I don't know what the fuck it's called. Uh, whatever the one, Final Frontier. Final Frontier. He was like, yeah. yeah. He goes, you know, Maiden's got three guitar players. They're really not doing shit. He goes, there's a new band with three guitarists. Uh, it's really good. Uh, you should check them out. They're called Ghost. I was like, huh, okay, cool. So I, I remember talking to Steve Keeler about it and he's like, oh yeah, yeah, it's, you know, they're kind of like retro rock kind of, you know, I got it at the store, come get it. So I, I got it from Steve and Great I really stuff. dug it. And um, I, I remember they came to America for two dates in 2011. I saw them, I had to look it up at the uh, the basement of Webster Hall. Yes, June yes. 1st, 2011. They did Maryland Death Fest and they did this gig and, and, and they were great. You know, they just came out. They had the masks on on this little tiny stage. And the Papa Pope guy, he didn't say a fucking word. It was very mysterious. He had the, yes. the Pope thingy thing with the incense or whatever. 
but it was cool and it was creepy. And you know, they were they were underground. And then they started to get bigger and bigger. And you know, they put out some shit that I didn't I didn't like. I didn't love it, but I didn't jump off yet. But then uh, in 2018, they did this thing, and I, I don't know what the fuck they were doing. Where the the Papa guy's like, oh well, Papa number three is dead, but now Papa four is taking over, <laughs> and he was like. He was like some, he went from the cool black and white face paint What's to looking like an old eyes? Jewish man with like wrinkles, or... looking like an old dude that like, like stayed in the bathtub too long. Oh, no, he was, he, like, looks... he was like a bald Jewish dude or a bald old Italian man. And, and then like, he, and, and, and then uh, Chris, and then he turned into Father Guido Sarducci. Yeah, that's what, that's what he looked like to me. Yeah. Father, it reminded me of Father Guido Sarducci because now, in, like I said, in 2011, he didn't say a fucking word. Now here we are in 2018, and he's cracking the worst dad jokes possible. So, but now I didn't know any of this when I got tickets to the, see the show May 15th, 2018 at the Capitol Theater in Port Chester, New York. They did two sets. I went with a bunch of friends. Huge mistake uh, because I go and, and I'm like, ah, there's all these little kids wearing the fucking black and white makeup. Like when you go see Kiss or when you would have seen Kiss in the 70s. Yeah. Right? It's cool. That's a cool look. Right? So, yeah, he's going to come out like that, right? Nope. Set one, he comes out and he's fucking Father Guido. And he's making all these stupid, schmaltzy dad jokes. And he looks like an, like an old zip. <laughs> you know, he looks like he should be fucking getting super sod off the top of the deli. I'm like, what the fuck, man? Like, I couldn't... Uh, uh, if, I didn't, if I didn't go with friends, like uh, if I drove myself... I would have gotten in the car and fucking left. But nope. So we go through all the set one. They take an intermission. And I'm like, all right. He's going to come out with the cool black and white makeup oh. and do his evil Pope shtick. Right? Nope. Mm. More of the of the old Italian man stuff. You know, he's doing his little funky. I, I was like, I wanted to kill myself. I'm like, this <laughs> is unbelievable. I was like, and I can't believe nobody gave them shit over this. Like, if I went, if I bought tickets to see King Diamond... And he went and, and purposely made himself look like an, like an old Italian man and started cracking dad jokes. I'd be like, get the fuck out of here. So I was done with Ghost, and I've never gone back. I'm like, I'm done. Go off that wagon. Off that fucking wagon. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure, he's back now, five years later. But I'm done. I'm over Ghost. That's it. But, uh, yeah, I was at that same show with Chris. I wasn't sitting with him, but I knew he was upstairs. Oh. And I was my first experience on that side of Ghost, and it was a shock. Yeah. Because they had this ominous, creepy, very cool, like almost like Hammer horror film image at one time. Like when I first saw them, they were with Blood Ceremony in the city, and you felt like you were on the set of like a Hammer horror film with those two bands. And then it gradually turned into something, but now look at their headlining arenas. Since me and Chris are definitely the odd man out, but uh, right, nobody else. I don't. I was going to use them for tonight, but I don't want to jump their shark yet because I didn't hear the new album. And maybe I'll like it again, but I didn't hate the last album. But I'm not a giant fan of this new stage show and him riding a tricycle around. And right. I don't know if he did that, but I I know a lot of friends that were really into them that don't like him, but they also moved into a whole nother audience where people love them. I, I saw that same that same tour with Butch Jones and uh, Tig Man. We went to Albany and saw it. And the second time, that's the shock. It wasn't as bad. I mean, they're still really good live, but uh, it wasn't the same experience that Chris. Chris wanted a horror film. He didn't right, get which a is what film they either. showed me earlier. He got a comedy horror film now. Well, they can't make, I have to be honest, from what I've heard, like I've heard a lot of shit you know about this band from people who like them like me and people who don't i feel mm. like they can't make anybody happy because uh people don't like them and then they're, they don't like them because they had this image that they were super heavy and they weren't heavy and they kind of had like a more like kind yeah. of rock vibe to them but they their logo looked like it was you know heavy metal or possibly death metal and the whole like image thing and then, you know, once you take that away and then other people, you know, it's a problem with the fact that, you know, now it's not heavy enough image wise, but I feel like there's one of those bands that you just like, they're just never going to make everybody happy. I think the problem is they released that first album and it really wasn't what they were all about. 
Because that first album is very evil, very satanic, very heavy. And then right from the second album, you could tell these guys were really good songwriters. They were they love old fashioned mm. pop music and classic rock. That's really what they're all about. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I noticed when they opened up for Maiden on that tour, I could tell that they were going that the, the whole gimmick thing was kind of going through their heads a little bit. I'm like, these guys are getting really big, really quick. And I think they're going to lose a lot of fans that were on board within the first album or two. Yeah. I still think their songs are good. It's good catchy yeah. stuff, but it's, it's, it's not the band that they were on that first album anymore. Yeah. And I, t- and uh, they, they've got a whole new audience. And I mean, there, there's, there's people that think that's a new vocalist every time. It's almost like pro wrestling, like we were talking yeah. pro wrestling. They really do. I saw. I oh yeah, like well, that's oh, that's the new Papa. No, that's not I the same. Gimmick, guy. People, it's the same guy. And and I tell you what, all the guys in the band have been changing regularly. Oh, sure, it's like a revolving door of personnel there. Oh yeah, they've used I mean, a lot I of. I mean, video from the show I went to, and somebody was like, "Man, I'm so glad they got rid of that old singer. He sucked." <laughs> same guy, people. Hello. That's funny. That's so, so wait a minute, Sydney. So. He, does he come back out as the Pope? As you, when you just you just caught them recently, right? Yeah. So he does. It's kind of like a mixture now. I want to say he got rid of the Jewish man face. He doesn't do that okay. anymore. Um, but hey, instead, <laughs> instead, instead of it being makeup, though, it's it's like a mask. It's like a mask that is has the makeup. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Like it's like the same makeup, but now it's like it's like that mask, but it has makeup on it now. Um, and he still does the dad joke thing, you know, he comes out there and is like, how the fuck are you guys doing? You know, he does like the Italian like yeah. thing. That's but where we did, get the Father Guido thing yeah. from. He did come out um, with like in the middle of the show for one song, he wore the whole Pope thing. He came out with the, the thing. Oh. Um, for year zero, he did it. And um, that was pretty much, or I think he maybe did it for like a song and a half or something. And then that was pretty much it. Interesting. Um, but I mean, I, I still, I still am a huge fan. I mean, I, I really enjoy the show. Um, oh, yeah. they, they, it's funny they pump like incense now. And I don't know if they were doing that, but uh, they were literally like pumping the smell of like church incense into the. Venue. Like you're going to church, right? The wow. church of yeah, ghosts. Like fifteen minutes, like I, it was like fifteen minutes before, and I was like, it smells like I'm like, wow, you know, like ten again. Like this is like. Weird. I mean, in the beginning when they came around, they were they were calling those rituals as yes. sort of like Belphegor or oh, Dark yeah, Funeral yeah. or Wittain would. And I mean, I mean, it was very. And then when you went to see Wittain and then you realize what was real and what was fake. Well, and I don't know if it's completely fake, but I mean, they sing a lot about Satan stuff, but they sing it very nicely. Ghost he, does. He does yeah. some explaining. He's, he, yeah. he basically says everything that the devil um, mm-hmm. like everything that was satanic growing up for him, music and movies and stuff yeah. has always made him like so happy and inspired him. And so that's kind of how he looks at it. But, you know, regardless of separate conversation. Um, yeah, we could have a whole episode on ghosts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but good pick. I can understand why you feel that way. Chris. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, Cans, you're up next, number two. Okay. Um, one thing about ghosts I had read that they said, uh, and I, I thought maybe it was in the liner notes of the first album, it was like, you know, we want your kids and we want them to believe in Satan, but, you know, we're not going to do it in a scary way. We're going to hide it all in these, you know, catchy hooks and nice choruses and whatever. Yeah. And that's going to get them, you know, so I just thought that was <laughs> Well, I mean, they cover that ABBA song and they're like a, they're like a hard rock ABBA most of the times. So they have all that pop. It's very poppy. It's very catchy. Yeah. I mean, I used to have the most fun at those shows. I would drink as many as Kristen, maybe not 12 beers, but probably in the end of the night. And we would be, I mean, ghost shows were so much fun. I mean, when they played the chance, it was just like ominous yeah, and down. everyone's dancing and singing and it was good stuff. Yeah, but oh, yeah. They might be getting back there. Who knows? All right. My second band, uh, they were huge in the seventies. Uh, they lost a couple members and then they got them back. And oh. They put out this album that I really enjoyed called Done With Mirrors. I'm talking about Aerosmith. And Done With Mirrors was kind of a flop. And they went and they had a little visit with the devil. And they sold their soul to the devil. The devil of hits. This is a guy, when you bring him into your orbit, you will have hit music but you will completely shit all over your entire legacy, everything you've done before. So they hired Desmond Child 
to help them with permanent vacation and write them a bunch of crappy hits. Mm. And for me, I've always been, ever since I was made for loving you, I noticed that, you know, if Desmond Child comes in and gets involved with your heavy band, he's going to turn them into something that you're not even going to recognize. <laughs> and I mean, he wrote Lick It Up, you know, he did the same thing to Kiss. And then, you know, he did, gosh, how many hits did he write for Aerosmith? You know, Crying Crazy, Crying Crazy, Amazing, Crazy, Amazing, Crying Crazy. <laughs> Angel. Fucking <laughs> an elevator. Angel. So for me, <laughs> their time Aerosmith after permanent vacation and, and laying down with Satan Desmond Child almost erased everything cool that they did and in my mind that they did before that I mean I'm, I'm a little bit over it now I will go back and listen to old Aerosmith and enjoy it as much as I always did but honestly after permanent vacation I had no time for that band was, like a that tornado was, outside my window right yeah now. It's same thing it's yeah, same thing here too. in Newburgh. yeah <laughs> yeah but that that was that was one of mine too because i remember the exact same thing it's like oh here's a pre world premiere video dude looks like a lady and i'm you know listen to that and it's like was that a fucking horn section i mean you you have <laughs> you have uh perry and whitford you know and then it's like the next song what uh angel i, I, I hate it ragdoll is fucking terrible and you know, I, re I, I remember hearing people say oh well yeah the deep the deep tracks are really good it's like i hate three songs i'm not buying it you know it's like you know you're over three i'm not gonna buy it and, yeah. and pump i think is just as you know there's a lot of a lot it of might shit worse. You know, jamie's yeah. got a gun is is just is just you know like someone pissing in the it's just i i hate i hate that well, know. what's interesting is so many people jumped on board with those yeah. albums that oh, yeah. to the yeah. so they, yeah, they, sold, they think that stuff is amazing and so it's, yeah they sold they sold more records than ever oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. starting in 87 it's crazy right yeah. yeah but i thought they were back with done with mirrors i, I really enjoyed that album i, I like that like, i think the only good. person who ever heard it you know yeah. And this, and this, like, is, this is a really good uh, tribute album called uh, Right in the Nuts that is a whole bunch of uh, stoner bands doing classic Aerosmith songs and they heavy oh. them up. And all the songs are, are from, uh, the, with the exception of Lightning Strikes and Let the Music Do the Talking from uh, Done With Mirrors mm. are all, everything from there on back. Oh. So I uh, have uh, Fireball Ministry, Alabama Thunder Pussy, uh, uh, Atomic Bitchwax, uh, Five Horse Johnson, Raging Slab, a lot of really good, really good bands. It's called Right in the Nuts hmm. from uh, 2000. Pretty cool. All right. Well, my number two pick was Aerosmith too, but I guess we covered that already because I was a huge Aerosmith fan in the 70s. I, I had a, one of those little eight-track boxes that I used to carry around at school and it lived with rocks stuck in it. And then I got to see them at the, finally with uh, Ted Nugent and Frank Marino, Mahogany Russian Journey, and I didn't like them as much then because they didn't put on a great live show that day. Uh, Ted Nugent and Frank Marino and the other band sounded great, but Aerosmith, I don't know, they were all screwed up that day and started to lose my luster, uh, especially after Joe Perry had left the band. And, and then I'll ditto what Christian said, how they turned, I thought, it, I thought they met Bon Jovi in the eighties. I didn't know they met, it was the producer's fault, but uh, they really turned into this radio pop band and I was done, but then I was listening to Slayer and everything else. So I totally, I never got rid of the early stuff because I would still love to listen to that, but I totally jumped the shark on Aerosmith in the eighties for sure. But, uh, so someone took Aerosmith. I'm going to go with guns and roses, uh, guns and roses loved appetite for destruction when it came out. And I didn't mind the use your illusion one and two. I thought there were some great songs in that, but then I started, he, I had saw guns and roses at the fairgrounds in Middletown. I think I might've seen them one other time too, somewhere, but, uh, hearing how Axel would make you wait to go on stage and that whole thing with Metallica and the riot and everything else. And I'm just like, I was done with them after that. I'm like, screw them. And, you know, I, I can still listen to their old stuff now, but I totally jumped the shark on Guns N' Roses right after, right around Use Your Illusion 1 and 2. And what did they do? They waited. They made you wait for years. They're like they were like Boston. Well, they're gonna make, uh, we're on top of the world, but we'll make you wait for years for another record. 
Yeah. Another God. shitty record. True. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, they're still huge. You're playing giant stadium uh, still, but uh, so they're, they're still that? doing great off of those couple records, that you know. China, Chinese conspiracy, Chinese yeah. democracy, whatever Chinese the fuck democracy. it was called. It was a Best Buy exclusive that sold really shitty. So Dead Best up. Buy, after a while, they blew them out for a buck ninety nine. Wow. I, I did pick one up, but I couldn't. I remember it kind of sucking, but um, and for I mean, buck ninety nine, I, I couldn't. I couldn't pass it up. That was like there's a still, listen once and done, right? Yeah. I mean, there's still a huge license. There's been two pinball machines made for the band. I mean, they're still household name. People still love them, but hey, you know, they're really resting on laurels from a long time ago. 1987, yeah. yeah. Sure. We're waiting on the, you know, I've heard a lot and I've heard Slash say a bunch lately about how there's a new album coming eventually. And it's like, then just release it. You guys, I'm sure, I mean, you've been together now since, again, since 2016. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been that long already. You had the whole pandemic to write songs. There, there's got to be. And they, <laughs> the they two songs it? that they released were old stuff. Yeah. Like the, the two recent singles, which I didn't like absurd at all. I like hard school a little bit. But mm. the, the two new singles were like old songs and like they're, you know, from years ago. So it's like they had, you know, there wasn't even like they were like new and it's going to be on something. I don't know. But I hope they come yeah. out with something again soon because, I mean, I think. They seem to be really getting along. I think it probably could be really good, but you know. Yeah, how how hard is it to put an album out right now? But I, don't know. I mean, of course, we could talk about Boston too with that, but never mind. <laughs> Back in the day. All right, Pete, uh, you're up for your number three. All right, so my final one for today really pains me a lot because I love this guy to death. He's been one of my favorite guitar players my entire life, but. You know, uh, I don't know what the reason is. Uh, it's very similar to the Ingve story. Robin Trower. Love Robin okay. Trower. Love him. I mean, I grew up loving all his early albums. I like a lot of most of his 80s albums. I like a lot of his 90s albums. But man, in the early 2000s, Robin, I guess, decided, and for whatever the reason, when I go into the studio, I'm going to sing. I've never sung before, but I'm going to sing. Because maybe it's too expensive to hire a vocalist or to have your bass player sing who sings live. Uh, and every album that he's released over the last like 15 years or so is just got his uninspiring, nasally, not very good vocals on them. The albums are kind of like run of the mills blues rock albums. Yeah, he still plays great. I love him, but I just can't get on board with buying any of his albums anymore because i just to me i just i can't get past that voice of his and it's just he's not a singer it's like you're one of the you're guitar legends ever you know of all time but when you've had someone like you know james dewar or davy patterson or jack bruce or livingston brown singing on your albums throughout your career and they're all great singers or were great singers and now you're going to, as someone who's never sung before, and I, I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who are Trower fans who are like, yeah, these new albums are just not all that great. Man, he just, I well, wish he would get a singer. It's the same thing with Ingve. And I just, uh, he just doesn't cut it as a singer. And I love him to death. His playing is great. There's good guitar playing on these albums, but I won't buy him because it's like, I just can't listen to the voice. And it's like, you know, so basically I'm buying Robin Trower albums to listen to guitar solos. You know, I have all those great 70s and 80s albums to listen to, at which uh, to me, that's when he had, you know, great singers working with him. And uh, so, yeah, so I've kind of jumped the shark where Robin Trower has jumped the shark with me. I'll go see him live for sure, but I'm not buying any more records. And I, I hate to say that because I want to support him, but. Just can't do it. If he's watching, get a lead vocalist for Pete. <laughs> Please, Robin. Please. <laughs> Robin Trower on line two for you, Pete. <laughs> Ingve Malmsteen's on line four. Oh, my God. They're all coming to get me now. Yeah. Both angry. They're both very They were going to invite you to come to Sugarloaf, Pete. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> like uh, when the right. lady from Cradle of Filth was mad at Chris. Never mind. That's another that story. One. That's another story. <laughs> uh, speaking of Chris, you're up. All right. Woo All right. Uh, last one of the night. Man, I fucking love this band in the mid 80s. I loved, loved, loved their first two records. I had to, I was skinny back then so I could buy shirts and wear them and I had the posters and everything. Uh, the, the first Wasp record and The Last Command. Uh, I just love those records. The next two, they were okay. You know, I saw them a bunch of times on those tours and they were still fun. 
Um, but then they, uh, this is a double actually, uh, because then Blackie Lawless fired Chris Holmes or whatever the fuck happened. And then Blackie Lawless, you know, every song was about like, pretty much every song is about fucking. So he like decides to do a, sol a, a, a solo record about a rock star who, who uh, it's a rock opera about a depressed rock star. I'm like, this sounds fucking awful. I actually, I actually did get the album, The Crimson Idol. I never even listened to it. It's still shrink wrapped in my garage 30 years later. Uh, so I was like, fuck this band, I'm out. Um, and then in 1997, they did a record called Kill Fuck Die, and they, uh, which I bought and it sucked. <laughs> and uh, then I saw them, they did a co-headlining tour with Motorhead and I went to that and Motorhead fucking destroyed them. But it was it was cool to see Wasp with Chris Holmes again, even though they had this they had a fake pig that like Blackie Lawless cut the head off like it was like a barbecue. I was like, you guys are fucking Barbie. stupid. But, uh, oh, you know, I still stuck with them for a little bit. Uh, then I saw them. They played the chance and they had all these TV screens playing porn and Chris Holmes was already gone. So I just watched the porn, um, which I guess wasn't the point. But um, anyway, so I kind of jumped off again, but th by then I was interviewing bands. So Blackie Lawless did this out, and I mentioned this one other time. He did this record called Neon God, The Rise, part one, which was in 2004. And I go to interview him and he was a complete asshole to me. <laughs> like, um, I, it's a concept record about God knows what. I should have been like, dude, is this concept record about fucking? <laughs> if not, I should have just hung up on him. Because, it, no, it's about some politics or some shit. He got mad at me because the record company was supposed to send me this whole booklet, a packet of all the characters and who would portray them and the themes and all this other shit. This guy had the balls to tell me in 2004, in 20 years from now, people are still going to be talking about this record. Well, newsflash, it's 2022. Nobody fucking remembers that record or the second one. And I remember going, all right, Blackie, well, it's the 20th anniversary of Wasp coming up. Like, do you have anything special planned? And he's like, special? Yeah, this Neon God record is special, don't you? I, I was just like, oh my God, like everything um, I said. Uh, so he was a complete dick and yeah, I jumped down. off jumped off that wagon and that, and that was it. Haven't been back since. Uh, hey, we're still talking about it uh on the show though we're still talking about True. neon gods the man. one mention he's gotten in 10 years has been tonight right right <laughs> well he's on tour in the states actually with armored yeah in right? the fall yeah. yeah oh is that in the fall coming up okay yeah i yeah. think it's like november december wasp and armored saint it's the yeah. first time i'll there. let you know if i jump back on <laughs> yeah i think no chris holmes so that you know that's already kind of kind of a bummer it's been like a decade, right? Since they've been here is something or something oh, like that. Oh, I think, yeah. It's, it's been, been a while. I think like 10 years. I can they're remember. Like they keep, you know, they keep doing gigs in Europe, but nothing in the States. No, so, but they're gonna this fall. So yeah. you want to see a song for that record. Well, it's know? funny too, because you know, he stopped he stopped doing uh Fuck Like Animal. a Beast because yeah. he, you know found religion and all and i'm like wait dude you're the dude a couple of years ago you had fucking screens playing porn like i couldn't believe the cock shots they were playing at the chance of poughkeepsie <laughs> but now but then you found god so now you weren't singing animal fuck like a beast but oh guess what for this new tour coming up yeah the fans wanted it so now i can fuck <laughs> like a beast again well maybe maybe he talked to jesus and jesus was okay just for this tour but that's you know, just like, oh, yeah, bro, go ahead. Did you go to eat barbecue after that show that he killed the pig? Or, uh, oh, dude, it was so stupid. Motorhead came out and fucking crushed Craig. We waited like an hour. Steve, were you there? We, we waited like a fucking hour for what? Wasp to come on because Which of their tour? stage show. And at the end of the, they played, well, they only played like an hour because that's all Wasp used to do. They were kind of dicks, kind of like Man of War. They would give you like a 12 song set in the 80s mm. or the 90s. And um, it was a fucking, it was literally, it was a pig like you would get at a, at a, you know, if you were smoking a pig at your house and Blackie cut the head off. And uh, we were laughing what? like, that's the special effect. What? Like, dude, what? you used what? to have hot naked girls on stage. Do what? that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, where, like, what, what venue was this? You're asking if I was the there. one I saw was at the Irving Plaza. It was June no, 1997. No, no. I, I, but they I also did Toad's Place in New Haven. 
I've already jumped the shark way on them way before there. I could have used that band. I I saw them with I thought I saw them with Motorhead. No, it was Slayer, Wasp, and so oh, that else. was in '87. I was at that show too. That was yeah. That and Slayer was, destroyed Wasp. Destroyed that them. Night. That was January. But who, who didn't Slayer destroy in '87 yeah. when they were? No, yeah. That's true. That was Wasp inside the Electric Circus because I remember them yes. coming on with the Chris with the circus music, which you know that's that album was okay. Yeah, that was Raven Slayer and Wasp, January, like thirteenth, nineteen. Slayer was nasty that night. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I still say you should become a stand-up comedian, Chris, because you just oh. crack me up with that. He is amazing, is isn't he? Sydney is amazing. The <laughs> mighty Chris Allo, as he's known in Germany. Oh, the king okay. of the rants. That's funny. The king of the rants. The guys from Hammer King love him. Yeah. <clears throat> We're all too kind. All right. All right, Craig, let's go for it. Number three. Uh, mine is a twofer, and they're both uh, bands that I saw for the first time uh, in uh, at Ozfest '99, and they both begin with the letter S. So uh, first, and and the bands are, uh, I'll show you the, the the albums that are well, for, they're Slipknot and Static X. Okay. So uh, at, at the time when I saw Ozfest '99, um, Slipknot's album hadn't come out yet, and so. I, and this was in uh, Camden, New Jersey, and uh, mm -hmm. they they came out, and my uh, buddies that I was with, it was like they were from outer space. I mean, we'd never seen anything anything like this before, and it was like you know we liked the music and everything, and the the, the just the whole the whole thing with the unsettling look look of clowns. It was you know it was kind of freaky. Uh, Static X, I I liked a lot uh, when I when I saw them the first time, and uh, uh, I like the, this album quite a bit. Uh, just about it, all, I I like uh, just about all, every song on this. Their follow up was called Machine, which mm -hmm. it was in I think two thousand one. This is also pretty good, not as good as the first album. But then, their third, but then their third album was called Shadow Zone, which I previewed, didn't like, and I've been off the train since. Slipknot, I like. Maybe I, when I, I bought this, uh, once I knew that it was available, I like maybe five songs on this now. I bought their follow-up called Iowa, which uh, I looked on my iPhone. I like four songs on this. And then by the time their third album came out, I, I think I saw the video, didn't, didn't like it, and uh, I decided I was not a floppy pants guy, and so I was not going to be... Uh, uh, listening to to the new uh, new metal anymore, and uh, so I drew drew the line hard at uh, at the second album for for both of these bands. So it's uh, and I think Pete, you mentioned uh, at least one of them uh, on the uh, uh, UK connection. Uh, you saw who uh, you said about seeing uh, Slipknot, and you said your your son also uh, kind of got out of them kind of quick too. Yeah, so. he was big into both of those bands, and I took him to see both, and then. A year later, he was like, ah, I'm not into this stuff anymore. I'm like, thank God, because <laughs> never really my thing. Yeah, but I do, I do like the, fir the first Static X album. It has a nice, yeah. uh, it, it has some good good beat. And uh, I, I like, I, I do like most of the songs and uh, his, his voice is pretty good too. But the, it's just as they got a little bit further, I, I just lost, lost interest in that type of music. My, my wife is a huge fan of Static X and Wayne Static. And rest, rest in peace, Wayne. Yeah. 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 But I remember taking her to, ch to the chance to see him uh, probably right before he passed away. And it wasn't my thing that much, but my wife, my niece just loved that. It, it was Shadow Zone, all that heavy boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and they called it what? Uh, the disco death. Yeah, disco something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was like dancey, electronic, like heavy and yeah, kind of industrial, but not industrial, yeah, that's the word. Sorry, it's starting to like pour outside here too. Yeah, I was gonna um, say my lights are starting to flicker. <laughs> it's like the uh, monsters. Yeah, it just got really like I it was fine, and then all of a sudden I was like just taken aback. Mm -hmm. Um all right, uh Kansas for your third pick. Okay. Um this is a band that I, uh, they jumped for me. 
and then they jumped back, and then they jumped again. Um, <laughs> their first album came out in 94, and this is a time in my life I wasn't listening to a lot of really heavy music. I was uh, sort of cruising on my college, you know, jam band kind of Allman Brothers thing going on, and I heard this album, and it blew my freaking mind. It was uh, Burn My Eyes by Machine Head. Mm. And I'm like, damn, this is good shit, you know, and I bought that album, enjoyed these guys so much. And then the next album, their next couple of albums, you know, this new metal was everywhere else and it started creeping into their work. And I, you know, kind of just gave it up and lost touch. And then a few years later, they came out with this album called Through the Ashes of Empires, which like, it was like the first album all over again. I'm like, damn, this is so heavy. I love these guys. And then they followed it up with the blackening, which to this day, I think, you know, it's not my favorite album ever, but the, the guitars and drums. It's a great album. Yeah, great album. Best thing they ever did in my opinion. Fucking heavy. Yeah. You know, and I was like, you know, just waiting for that next one to come out. And it was, I think it was called Under the Locust or something like that. And just yeah. left. Dead was like, okay, you had two shots, guys, and you made the most of it, but you're, you know, I'm done with you now. So I haven't really checked back in with them since that um, album came out. And I don't get the feeling like it's worth it. But, you know, three albums in 20 years or so are freaking kick ass. But mm. I'm done with that then. So Machine Head. Oh, uh, yeah. That's a great pick because they were really they're across the board. They're up, they're down. Uh, I remember I, I was really into them on the Blackening album. And they actually opening up from Megadeth and Heaven and Hell, I saw that tour up in uh, up in Albany. And That's I remember right like really being into seeing Machine Head. And then a couple of years later, I could care less. They started touring a really weird bands after that too, Machine Head did. Yep. Yeah. Actually, are they involved in that new violence reformation? I know yeah. a couple of guys were in that band. And yeah, I didn't know yeah Rob, that. Rob Flynn parted ways with, uh, what's his name? We just saw an overkill. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Phil Demmel. I got the old. Phil, yeah, Phil Demmel. So Phil Demmel and left uh, Machine Head. Phil Demmel's in the new violence, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Now, yeah. uh, Rob Flynn has nothing to do with it. Cool. Uh, Steve, your last pick for the night. Back. Back to me again, and I'm going to do uh, two bands that I jumped was on the shark heavy, maybe like even doing like tricks at SeaWorld with uh, these bands in the beginning. So uh, if I'm on the shark that well, it was a shark riding uh, gentleman then, I guess. But uh, Queensryche will be the first one. Queensryche, I loved everything from, you know, the EP and uh, right up through uh, even kind of like the... Oh, Empire. I liked that a lot. And after that, I was done. It's just like I, I wanted to like everything that came out. It would come into the record shop. I'd put it on. It's like, ah, what is this? You know, and it took me years to get back into them. I really didn't even want to give them a chance. And uh, Operation Mind Crime 2 came. I was like, oh, maybe this is going to be put on. I ah, didn't get into that. And uh, so ended up liking them again when they got Todd. Uh, really, I saw them probably didn't listen to the record but i saw him open up for somebody and i was like wow they're pretty good again and uh condition critical was in my top 10 albums the year that came out so uh jump back on the shark with queen's and i mean jeff tate's still got the solo they're two different bands people love them both but uh i don't want jeff back in queen's that's my point i keep todd they're, they're back to being metal again maybe jeff wants to be metal again now i don't know but uh that's my one pick. And my other pick is Halloween. Halloween, I loved uh, Walls of Jericho. Still probably my favorite album by them. Uh, Keeper of the Seven Keys, one and two. And then they came out with, what was it? Pink Bubbles Go Ape. First yeah. of all, the name the name was a horrible name. If you were a metalhead in the late 80s, you know, listening to a lot of thrash and uh, learning, you know, learning about death metal and it's like, what are you guys doing? And I stopped listening to them until like 2018. They were coming to this, they were coming to the city. And I was, so I can remember them playing Best Buy. And I'd be like, you know, I was always in the metal scene in the city. It's like Halloween big enough to play Best Buy still. And what what did I miss all these years? And uh, so I bought tickets for the Pumpkins United and I went to that. And of course, 
then I said, well, I looked at the set list a couple of weeks before and I said, well, let me listen to these songs. And I, I was floored. I loved them. And I'm like, I stopped listening to them and they had so many great records and great songs. And so I stopped, they went back to being a power metal band again. And uh, I mean, the last album, last the album from last year was my uh, I think number two album of the year. So I, I'm back on the shark with Halloween. Great and I'd love to see them again. I hope they come to the States. I know Hammer Falls going out with them in Europe. And of course, their tour keeps getting canceled and canceled over there. So maybe they'll just bring it over here soon. So who knows? Let's see. Yeah. Well, cool. I mean, are we, are we going to do any like honorable mentions or it's up to you, Pete? What do you think? Uh, I could do one honorable mention. I'll, I'll mention Van Halen. I'll, I'll do Van Halen, my yeah. honorable mention. Yeah, that was one of mine. Van Halen, first album, another one, an eight track and the little eight track holder. Couldn't get enough of it. Liked everything up to Jump. As soon as Jump came out, I was done with them. And, you know, I, I look back at it now and I can enjoy some of the songs from that album. But <laughs> never was a big, I, I didn't mind the Sammy Hager stuff, but it wasn't really Van Halen for me. <laughs> There's my honorable. Cool. Anybody else? My, uh, my, my honorable was. Uh, anthrax and, and uh because i i really i liked them up until up through state of euphoria and when persistence of time came out i remember I, I borrowed that from my brother at the time and it was just the songs were just too long and i i, I just I, I don't know i just wasn't getting into it it was just kind of boring to me i i so i jumped off i jumped back on when john bush was in the band because i i did like those those albums uh for the for the most part and but then when Joey came back, I jumped off again because I just kind of I, I don't know I just they just don't do it for me uh, anymore. Something something about them I, I it's just not just not my not my thing anymore. So uh, my honorable was uh, Anthrax. I'm with you 100 percent, Craig. 100 percent. Yeah, my only honorable uh, was uh, Over the um, Swedish or Norwegian band, right? Swedish Norwegian. Where the hell are they from? Where is Over from? I, don't even I, thought was, I, thought I think they're Norwegian. Norwegian. Norwegian, right? Yeah. I mean, they put out that great Nottens Madrigal album in 97, which is a killer black metal album. And then like immediately in the next album, they started doing like ambient electronic trip hop music. They've done like synth pop albums and nothing they've done ever since has ever gone back to their extreme metal roots. And uh, I tried to listen to a couple of those albums. I know, I, I think Ryan and Nick both, yeah they do over and they they kind of like the newer stuff but man that's just not for me at all so uh i went and bought a couple of them and got rid of them and uh i still have natin's madrigal in my collection that is the only over album uh, other than that that's it i think i sound's doing all the heavy stuff now with his solo albums or every other solo album is heavy and then you know one spoke or whatever i think it's over is like most popular band in Norway right now. Or yeah, been. because they're, they're like a pop band, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, like a synth pop band or something. Yeah. I don't know. Not my thing. Nope. Mm -hmm. nope. Anybody else? Anybody say, anybody my, else? My only honorable mention, uh, which was on my list, uh, was Opeth. Uh, I, love, I love all the old stuff. Uh, I was a big fan. I saw their first ever gig in America at Milwaukee Metal Fest 1999 or 2000. I mean, I saw them like 15, 16 times. But they came out with this record called Watershed, where it was like, you know, the old stuff was always, they had the heavy and, and the light. And then with Watershed, it was like 90% light and like 10% heavy. And I was like, yeah, I'm done. So I jumped off the boat. And I understand that that was the last record that had any semblance of any death metal vocals. And it was very minimal on Watershed, which is what yes. made jump off the off the train then uh, and i guess they never look back and they're still doing well so god bless them but i can remember them. i can remember going to see them at uh webster hall and it was just when they switched over and that's when michael decided live that he wasn't doing any growl vocals and people were like walking out in the street after going like wow that was weird like there was not they were used to the heavier edge and I still love Opeth, but I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah. I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, he said, you know, he, he grew tired of the whole 
extreme metal scene and he's basically what they're playing now is is what he really likes you know the whole 70s hard rock and mm -hmm. prog and folk and all that psychedelic stuff you know and it's funny if you go because i've seen open live many times yeah he, i used to always think that he was one of the best death metal singers out there excellent the morales were great but when you saw them on the, those last couple i mean they still play some of that old stuff live but man he doesn't sound the same so i wonder if like physically he can't just do it anymore which is another could be another reason why because he, sure. he sounds way different now when you hear him singing those older tracks with the growls it's like it's not quite the same and you're right live again they did go back to doing some of those songs for a while they weren't doing them at all right yeah yeah yeah, yeah i'm seeing them um with mastodon next month so uh oh cool that would be a great show make sure yeah. you don't miss uh chemists who i think is opening up that tour they're really okay. good their really chemists cool. are really good yeah. yeah yeah cool well i think that's it um <laughs> that's, just, that's just fun it was fun hearing everybody's uh picks and um you know as pete always says feel free to leave in the comments below what bands you know jump the shark for you uh you know where you kind of hopped off or hopped back on or do you agree with any of the picks that anybody said tonight? Mm -hmm. um, and Pete, I mean, you would obviously know better than anybody what's going on uh, on the channel the next week or so. So do you want to share that? That's right. So we've got uh, In the Prog Seat coming up tomorrow where we're going to be talking about some of our favorite uh, like one-time collaboration albums. So where some notable musicians or players or singers, whatever, got together. They're from other bands. They got together, did an album together, and then that was all you got. So that's coming up tomorrow. Wednesday, we've got uh, new album review day, where I think I'm going to be reviewing the new uh, Voivod, the new Immolation, uh, the new 10, maybe the new, uh, what else I got here? I don't know. I got all sorts of new stuff here. New uh, Tea Party, that sort of thing. Thursday, we've got uh, the Monsters Den. Friday morning at the Fun House with Martin Popoff. Saturday is uh, the UK Connection with Simon Bray and Stephen Reed. And Sunday is uh, album homework assignment with Simon Bray from the UK Connection going up against Lewis Nasser from In the Prog Seat. So uh, that, that's a really, really fun show. We just taped that today, actually. So uh, stay tuned for that and a lot more here on the channel. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I guess... Uh... Thank if you, you everybody. want to mention the show or, or the Overkill show. Right? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah so stay, talk about the Overkill show. That's right. So stay tuned oh, right okay. after this. Uh, Chris and Craig and myself will be back for a quick little review of the Overkill concert at uh, the Chance in Poughkeepsie, New York. That was just uh, a couple days back. So that's coming up right after the Hudson Valley Squares tonight. Yeah, and uh, thanks, Pete, for letting me be a very mediocre host this evening. Very <laughs> good job, Cindy. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's was... so funny. It's interesting just, like, the, the difference of, you know, like doing stuff on my own channel and, you know, you hop onto somebody else's and it's just a totally different thing because you never do it before. Um, but I'm glad that I was able to be a part of the episode even though I didn't have a lot of picks. So, for Pete, for Chris, for Craig, for Chris again, for Steve, this is the Hudson Valley Squares, and I'll see you next Monday. Boom. Everybody. I I like having a host. I think Pete must like it too. Pete, it's less it's good for you. It's not, it's not good. <laughs>